indeed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Jacob said this is going to be very much uh, a sequel to Andras's talk. Um, and unfortunately, like many sequels, it probably won't be quite as good as the original one. But um, <laughs> so Andras described some uh, work where machine learning was used to uh, discover new patterns. Uh, new connections between uh, different branches of, of knot theory. Um, and that led to some conjectures. And I think what makes the story interesting though is that actually we were in, able to end up by proving versions of those conjectures. So really what I want to focus on uh, today uh, are the proofs. Um, but first of all, kind of let me... Mm -mm. Is that not working? Try clicking on the slide. Uh, is that working now? Yes. But knot theory is um, very much a uh, diverse subject which falls naturally into three very distinct subfields. So there's uh, hyperbolic knot theory, um, which is uh, focused on the hyperbolic structures that are known to exist on many knot complements. Um, there are gauge and uh, FLIR theoretic techniques, such as Hegard FLIR homology, cyber Witten theory, instant on homology, et cetera. And they tend to have connections uh, with four dimensions. So as Andres said, um, uh, it's tall. One of the things that many knot theorists are interested in is you have a knot sitting inside three space, but you view three space as the boundary of R4 plus. And you consider surfaces sitting inside R4 plus. And um, this branch of, of uh, knot theory is, provides a lot of information about such surfaces. And then there's also quantum topology, which uh, uh, sort of started with the uh, Jones polynomial, but there are now many other um, uh, quantum type invariants, such as Kovanoff homology, the quantum SU2 invariants, and so on. And these are very different fields. Um, there is some connection between the first two, partly due to groundbreaking work of Kronheimer and Rovka. You mean the second two, right? So between the, set, the, the last two, yes, yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. Uh, due to groundbreaking work of Kronheimer and Rofka, uh, which related Kovanoff homology with uh, FLIR theory. But really, hyperbolic knot theory is uh, really quite separate. And let me illustrate that by um, showing you a printout of uh, a speaker list at um, two conferences that are happening this summer. So on the left-hand side, um, this is the list of speakers that's happening at Alan Reed's 60th birthday conference. Alan is a hyperbolic manifold theorist. You can see our very own Peter. Uh, and then on this side here, there's a conference happening in Trieste about a month later, and you can see the topics interplay of three-dimensional and four-dimensional topology, flow homology theories and associated variants, Kovanoff homology, and geometric and analytic aspects of gauge theoretic equations. There's that speaker list. And these are organized alphabetically. So you can quite quickly see that these sets are disjoint. <laughs> so it really is a, a really quite divided subject. And um, the goal was to try to find connections between these different fields. And we focused on um, the many different knot invariants that arise from the different fields, uh, so, such as on the hyperbolic side, uh, the, the most basic invariant is the volume, cusp shape, length spectrum, trace field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a huge list of hyperbolic invariants that one can calculate. Uh, on this side, uh, the three slash four dimensional invariants. Well, I've already mentioned some of them, um, but we particularly focused on the signature because um, uh, it's very easy to calculate, which is important you know, when you're looking at any millions of examples. Um, and also um, it's 
known to provide a lot of information about three plus one dimensions, about surfaces sitting inside of R4 plus. Um, and also um, there seemed to be a better prospect of potentially being able to connect it with this site. But <clears throat> that is indeed what, what happened. But um, so, so what we tried to do was we tried to take invariant an invariant from one side and see if it could be predicted in terms of the invariants on the other side. So we looked at the signature and we saw it, see if it could be predicted uh, using the hyperbolic invariants. And you could ask this question just about hyperbolic three manifolds. Yep. Uh, yes, you couldn't do it for hyperbolic three manifolds, except signature is not defined for hyperbolic three manifolds, but you can indeed do variations of this question for hyperbolic three manifolds and we should. Okay, so the homology is not easily computed, I see. Okay, so that was the goal. <clears throat> and um, let me just remind you, so, so like many sequels, there has to be a slightly tedious expositional recap of what happened in the first episode. Um, so I'll try and uh, 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 battle through this fairly fast. So here's the definition of the knot signature. So you take your knot and you pick a ciphered surface for this. This is a compact orientable surface embedded in three space whose boundary is the knot. And um, associated with that, there's a, um, a, a, a symmetric bilinear form called the symmetrized cipher form. Um, and it's a form on the first homology of the surface. So you <clears throat> take two elements of the first homology and the output is an integer. You think of those two elements of first homology as well, you represent them by loops in the surface. Um, so you have loops L1 and L2, and then you form L2 plus just by pushing off L2 in the normal direction um, so that it's disjoint from the surface. And um, so you then can look at the linking number between L1 and L2 plus. So if you don't have this right hand side, that's the cipher form and is used to produce, for example, the Alexander polynomial. But if we symmetrize it by adding on L2, the linking number of L2 and L1 plus, this is the symmetrized cipher form. And um, it turns out that its signature is a, a, an invariant of the knot, not necessarily, not just at the cipher surface. So um, a, a very important classical invariant, which was defined uh, in the 1960s. So, um, on the other side, we have hyperbolic structures, and uh, uh, Andres talked about them, but I'm just going to recap. So, a hyperbolic structure is a complete finite volume Riemannian metric of constant curvature minus one. Uh, Mostow rigidity says that if you have such a metric, then it's unique up to isometry. And Thurston's so called monster theorem um, says uh, that actually. The uh, a hyperbolic structure exists on um, many knot complements. It says specifically that a complement of a non trivial knot has a hyperbolic structure if and only if it's not a torus knot. In other words, can't be embedded on the standardly, can't be drawn on the standardly embedded torus in three space. And it's not a satellite knot, which is where you've taken some non trivial knot and then you've drawn your specific knot in a little regular neighborhood of it, but not trivial way. Okay, so in some sense, um, uh, generic knots are hyperbolic, and it's certainly reasonable to say that every knot can be built up from hyperbolic and um, pieces that are somewhat like torus knots. So there are lots of interesting aspects to the geometry of, um, uh, of uh, the hyperbolic structure. Um, and um, uh, the one that's particularly relevant for us here is the so-called cusp geometry. So any knot complement um, has an end, which is just a, a, a form torus cross half open interval. You can think of that as just uh, taking a tubular neighborhood of your, of your knot, and then when you drill that out, what's left, when you drill the knot out, what's left is, is torus cross half open interval. 
And when the knot's hyperbolic, then that end has a canonical geometry um, called a cusp. And the way the geometry works is you take uh, the, uh, um, the upper half space model for hyperbolic three space, um, and you consider the horrible, which consists of all the points where the Z coordinate is, is greater than or equal to one. And then there's some um, group of Euclidean translations that preserve this horrible, um, that is used to build the cusp. So it's some Z cross Z subgroup of the group of all Euclidean translations acting discreetly on um, uh, uh, each horizontal plane. And um, so a fundamental domain for that action uh, in each plane is just given by a little parallelogram. And um, so uh, uh, what you get is parallelogram cross half open interval with uh, opposite sides identified. And that's, that's torus cross half open. So um, uh, we'll typically take the maximal cusp in, in, in the hyperbolic manifold, which is where you've taken such a thing and then expanded it out as far as possible until it just bumps into itself. So <clears throat> the boundary of the cusp is a Euclidean torus. It's just this horizontal plane quotiented out by this Z cross Z action. Um, so you can think of that horizontal plane as just complex plane and uh, you're quotienting out by some lattice lambda. So you can think of uh, zero sitting inside your lattice and then you have um, each, each uh, curve on the torus lifts to um, a path in the plane starting at zero and ending at some other point in the complex plane. And um, so there are two specific curves on the torus that are particularly important. There's the, the longitude, which as you run along your knot, uh, it's the, what the curve that runs along the knot and that has zero linking number with the knot. And um, we just rotate the whole picture so that that lifts to a real number lambda. And then there's the meridian, which is the curve which encircles the knot. Um, and uh, so uh, we, we can just, by flipping, just arrange for that to have positive imaginary part. And this um, uh, is all information that's uh, provided by this remarkable program, Snappy. Um, you can just type in, you can just draw a picture of your knot and it'll find the hyperbolic structure on it and then compute all these invariants. And this is a typical output. So this is what you get for the knot six one. And it literally have your little parallelogram there which shows you the cusp shape. Yeah. Can you tell what does the texture, I mean, the picture mean something beyond? Oh, what's all this other? Yeah, interesting. It'll tell me, a bit, it's a bit of a sidetrack. Uh, essentially, okay, I'll just say it in, in 30 seconds. Um, so uh, this cusp is, um, it projects down into the hyperbolic manifold to form torus cross half open interval. And if the, and that projection map, there's this projection map from the covering map from hyperbolic three space onto your, onto your manifold. So if you take the inverse image of the cusp, you'll see this horrible, but you'll see all of its covering translates, which are little horror, little balls sitting inside hyperbolic space. And that's the picture of them. That's what these little balls are. You can see them. And then there's a canonical um, triangulation that you can get from this. That's just what all the stuff in gray is. It's a uh, it's, it's really very beautiful picture. Can you remind us a uh, quickly snappy work? And so if you put in some lot with some data, when can we expect it to terminate? Um, so it, it um, what you do is you, well, there are different, several different input mechanisms, but the simplest is just to draw the diagram, um, which you can enter sort of just as a PD code or, um, and then what it'll do is it'll triangulate, from that it'll triangulate the knot complement. And then it'll try to realize the tetrahedra 
um, as actual hyperbolic tetrahedra um, by solving a system of equations. Um, and um, it's not guaranteed to work. So if it doesn't work, it'll retriangulate. Um, and it's a remarkable fact that it tend, you tend need to, to do very little retriangulation to find the hyperbolic structure. And it'll do it with <coughs> remarkable efficiency. So you can easily give it, say, a 60 crossing diagram and it will find that hyperbolic structure like that. It's, it's, it's a remarkable, remarkable program. Maybe you said this, but can you choose any basis to define lambda mu, or do you want it to be a rounded one or something? Um, any basis for the torus? It, yes, you, for the yet. yes, you could, you could, but there's a distinguished basis coming from the longitude, which runs along the knot and has zero linking number with it, and the meridian, which encloses the knot. So, yeah. What does the program do if you hand it a knot that the complement is not hyperbolic? It says, can't find it. <laughs> um, yeah. Does it give you that answer or does it just run forever? No, it, it gives up after a while, yes. Um, it has various sort of built-in tests which where it thinks that it's, it, where, where it, 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 it says it thinks it's not hyperbolic, but it doesn't guarantee that if it can't find a hyperbolic structure, it, it's not guaranteed that there isn't one. But <clears throat> remarkably, there's a verify command which if it finds the hyperbolic structure, you press verify. And then if that says yes, it really has found the hyperbolic structure, uh, which is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really amazing program. So when you generate millions of examples, how many times does that happen? Right, so the, um, uh, well, it, it, it's, it fails very, very rarely. And normally when it fails, it fails for the good reason that there is no hyperbolic structure. The verify command is harder to like. So the reason why it's a separate command is because um, the way it actually works is it goes from what was a, a floating point solution in uh, of these equations specifying the hyperbolic structure to an actual solution involving exact arithmetic. You you, you specify the uh, uh, like the 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 the. the, the um, you specify the, the, uh, the, the numbers as actual roots of polynomial equations. So it has to find, has to guess those polynomial equations. And so it goes via parry, this number theory package, which when you give it a, some floating point number, it, it'll guess what, what algebraic number is closest to it, it thinks it is. And that is less, that, that starts to break more quickly. So typically for our examples, we found what we thought were hyperbolic structures, but we didn't actually verify them. There's no reason to think about that. Okay, um, so, um, so we ran our machine learning algorithms to see if um, the various hyperbolic invariants uh, could predict a, a signature, and they could. And the, the three main features that um, were being used to predict the signature were just the, the three numbers, lambda, the real part of mu and the imaginary part of mu. So exactly the data that you need to specify this cusp geometry. It was kind of remarkable that the signature should just be completely, not completely, but mostly encoded by the cusp geometry. I was certainly very, very surprised by this. So um, the natural thing to do was to now do some more straightforward detective work of trying to work out what the relationship was. Andre showed this plot last time. So here is sort of meridional translate, the real part of meridional translation on the x-axis, uh, signature on the y-axis, and then the coloration is coloring, but colored by the, uh, uh, the longitudinal translation, lambda. And you look at that, <clears throat> we look at that, wow, that's, very beautiful and something is clearly going on. Maybe this is not just some random scatter plot. Uh, you could see something's going on, but we don't, couldn't work out exactly what. And we were stuck for a little bit, but there's one obvious feature, well, there are many features of this. One obvious feature is that the dots, each dot is a knot, obviously, the dots are clustered in the, this quadrant and this quadrant, apart from a little bit of noise near here. And so what that means is, that the signs of the signature and the real part of the meridional translation are highly correlated with each other. 
And now, just going back, the real part of the meridional translation just tells you whether this parallelogram is skewed this way or this way, like whether it's skewed to the right or to the left. And this seems to control the sign of the signature. So what we tried to do was try to find some way of measuring this skewness. And um, we came up with a so-called natural slope. So what you do, this is again something that Andras described here, you, you think of your torus, your, your, your cusp torus as enclosing the knot like so, you pick a meridional representative for mu, a, a, a geodesic representative for mu, pick some point on that and fire a geodesic, Euclidean geodesic perpendicularly called mu perp, and it'll run along the knot and eventually come back to the back to mu. And in doing so, it'll have run along one longitude plus some number of meridians. That number is not necessarily integer because you haven't necessarily exactly come back to where you started from. But that number is therefore a real number s and uh, you define the natural slope to be, to be minus s, just it was technically easy just to have minus s. And a little bit of Euclidean calculation just says that you can get this as the real part of, of lambda over here. Yeah. Uh, what is the metric there? Or are you just living on the torus? I'm living on the Euclidean torus. Two dimensional, not. Three dimensional okay. Euclidean torus. Now, that's, so this is actually, it's, it's the two dimensional Euclidean torus, but it is a subset of the hyperbolic manifold. Yeah, and it's okay. given by its induced Riemannian metric, yeah. Okay, so um, this seems to be like a natural measure of obscureness, right? You know, exactly when, if this, if, this, if this parallelogram was exactly rectangular, then when you fired off a new perp, it would run exactly in the longitudinal direction and you'd come, your slope would be exactly new, exactly zero, sorry. So this seemed to be like a measure of skewness. And so it seemed like a reasonable thing to try. And um, then you, we plotted just slope against signature. And we got um, these remarkable pictures. Um, so we use two different data sets here. This is just the complete list of all hyperbolic knots up to 16 crossings. This is a, a collection of, of, of random knots. So Snappy even provides a, a way of picking knots well, random knot diagrams, and um, yeah, you just find the hyperbolic structures on those, and 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 it gives you this remarkable plot. So you look at that and you say, it looks like slope and signature are linearly related to each other, um, with some error. And there's these error bars, and it seemed natural to conjecture that that error should be linear at most linear in the bottom. In fact, actually, uh, like calculations suggested it was even better than that, that it seemed to be maybe even linear in the square root of the volume. Um, but it turns out that it's not even linear in the volume. Um, and uh, as Andras's story told that, that we, we, we tried for a long time to prove that signature and slope were linearly related with a, a volume, with an error that was linear in the volume. But that turns out to be false. There are these counterexamples coming from um, so-called highly twisted knots. But so as we were trying to prove something that was false, we thought, okay, you know, okay, so we found this connection. We think we found a connection between these two different fields. On the one hand, signature three, four-dimensional invariant and slope derived from the hyperbolic invariants. How do we, we're still faced with the issue of how we connect those two areas. Um, and at least we've got something to aim for now. And um, uh, to, for example, we tried, we struggled quite a long time trying to prove this connection. Like for example, we, we thought maybe we could use the eta invariant. So the eta invariant is an invariant of, um, of, of manifolds defined by um, Tia, Donnelly and, and Singer. Um, uh, and it's a sort of correction term for the, uh, um, the, the T.S. Singer index theorem for manifolds with boundary. Um, 
And um, it naturally appears when you are looking at the signature of, say, a four manifold boundary. Um, and yet, nevertheless, it's, a, it's an invariant that's defined in terms of Ramanian geometry. So you think, OK, great, I've got something that relates exactly to signature of four dimensional manifolds with boundary. And I've got something that is actually defined in terms of Ramanian geometry. It seems like a good plan as a method of trying to connect these two different areas. It, it didn't, I mean, we just couldn't get it to work. It just, we just tried and couldn't get it to work. So instead, um, the thing that actually worked was... Um, Sorry, uh, Vicky, the invariant, one of your characteristics in any of those graphs that you have. I mean, you have irrelevant ones. Was that one of them? So the eta invariant is not easy to calculate. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah well, but um, so, so it wasn't there. It's 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 known to be related to um, Chern Simons invariant, and so that was one of our things. And this was completely uncorrelated signature. Yeah, that was another reason why we gave up. So, in fact, um, as I say, our initial conjectures were wrong, but um, we were able to come up with two correct theorems. Um, the first one is that the signature uh, differs from half the slope by a quantity that is bounded geometrically as a constant times the volume times the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. So the injectivity radius um, of a Riemannian manifold you can consider. In our case, it's zero because as you go up into the cusp, um, the distances get very small, and so uh, you, your size of embedded balls becomes very small. So instead, we varied that definition by taking, considering all points in the not complement minus the cusp, if we remove the cusp, and look at the injectivity radius based at those points, and then infamize it. Then you have to have this maximal cusp. Yeah, you have to have the maximal. Yeah. So, so this could be rewritten in terms of the, the length of the, like a minimum of the length of the shortest geodesic and information about the cusp. I guess I'm still struggling sort of to understand why you were using machine learning at all then. Like if you already had sort of an idea of what you wanted to prove or disprove, why go through like all the work to do machine learning data sets, write programs for it, and then it didn't really give you what you were looking for anyway? Right, well, okay, so we, we didn't know what we wanted to prove. We, we had a, a, we were hoping that there might be a connection between these two different areas, but we had no evidence for that, that there was such a connection. And we certainly had no idea of what it was. So up to this point, it's all been uh, completely data driven. And, um, uh, and the initial, uh, kernel of finding the connection between these areas was the machine learning, which said that the signature could be predicted in terms of these hyperbolic invariants. So, so then in that case, the percentage of 78, I think it was on Monday, I mean, from a machine learner standpoint of view, computer science, that doesn't really tell you anything. Like you need at least 90% be able to like make a conclusion so to speak, like 78, that's just like unfinished work. Yeah, right. So um, I wouldn't be standing here if I hadn't proved these theorems. <laughs> right, so, so I totally agree with you that the 78% that the is, I mean, what does it say? Well, it says that there's probably a connection. There's almost certainly a connection, but it doesn't say what it is. And um, it certainly doesn't give you, you know, a concrete answer. But it's much, much better than the baseline. So it says that something is going on. And that's what we needed to, to guide us as to the correct direction to look. OK, thank you. Maybe just to add quickly to that point about 78%, that tells you how likely, how often you're predicting the correct class. But if the model still assigns a high probability to the correct class or predicts a class that's like signature minus one or plus one, that still doesn't mean that the model is completely off. It still might be onto something, for example, this error term here. Right? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay, so, so as you say, this is, this, 
uh, is this theorem is now a theorem, but it, it, it was initially formulated as a, as a conjecture that was driven by the data. Um, and then there's a so more refined theorem that where we wanted to get an error that was linear in the volume. Um, and what this more refined theorem says is that the signature can be estimated in terms of geometric quantities with an, an error that's linear in the volume, but the geometric quantity is half the slope plus a correction term. So the correction term is where you look at all of the geodesics uh, in the manifold with length at most some, I put 0.1 here, um, that have odd linking number with the knot. Um, and for each such geodesic, there's a, a complex length whose real part measures the length of the geodesic and whose imaginary part measures the twisting as you parallel translate along the geodesic. You get a rotational, rotational holonomy, which gives you the imaginary part. And from that, um, is that number 0 0.1 important or? Well, it's some fixed epsilon. Um, it, 0. A any epsilon less than the Margulis constant would, would work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but but then as you change your epsilon, your C two changes. So I, because I didn't want to say C two depending on epsilon, I just thought that's it. Not point one. And um, so from this uh, from the, this, this complex length, there's a there's a, a correction term kappa, which I I, I won't define. Um, uh, so you'll see sort of how it arises. Okay. So um, these are the theorems that I want to uh, prove for you today. Um, and the proof goes by um, surfaces, um, uh, and in particular, spanning surfaces for the knot, um, but potentially unoriented spanning surfaces. So I, when I define the signature, um, I defined it in terms of by using a Seifert surface for the knot, which is a compact oriented surface whose boundary is the knot. But it's actually quite useful to consider compact unoriented or unorientable surfaces whose boundary is the knot. So this is not a hyperbolic knot, but yeah. I think people in Zoom cannot see the board. Ah. Well, I think I'm good at this point. Yeah. So uh, the, this is not a hyperbolic knot, but I'm just drawing this to give you an example of an unoriented spanning surface for it. Just this Mobius band whose boundary is the trefoil. Just an example. Um, so associated to such a surface, there's the Goritz form, um, which uh, again takes its input as the first homology of the surface. And which you realize as loops in the surface. And then the resulting integer is the linking number between L1 and L2 primed, where L2 primed is the double push off of the, of the loop. So you, you have your loop in your surface and you say, I'm going to push it off in both this and this direction. And that forms a, something that runs twice along your original loop. It might either be two copies of your original loop or might be actually just a single component that runs twice around. And you take the linking number of L1 with L2 primed, and that's your output number. This is the Goritz form. It's not obvious, but it's actually a symmetric form. Um, and Gordon and Litherland showed how you can compute the signature of the knot in terms of the signature of the Goritz form, plus the correction term, E, where E is the framing of the boundary. So if I take my surface and I just run along the boundary of that surface and run along the knot, that will run along one longitude plus some number of meridians. And that number of meridians is the framing. That might sound familiar. That's exactly like the slope. And it turns out that the relationship between E of S and the slope is going to be what's going to be crucial. So for an oriented cipher surface, 
this linking number between the boundary and the knot is always zero. And so this framing is zero. So for an, or for an oriented surface, you don't get this term, it's just the signature of, of this, the Goritz form, but for an unoriented surface, this number can be not zero. Another part of the story is um, building a triangulation of your hyperbolic manifold. So uh, this is a construction that goes back to Thurston and, and Jorgensen, I should really have put up there as well. It says that any closed hyperbolic three manifold can be triangulated where the number of tetrahedra is bounded geometrically in terms of uh, the volume and the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. Thurston didn't actually state it this way, but this is what the construction gives. So the way the construction works is as follows. You just pick epsilon, let epsilon be uh, the minimum of the injectivity radius divided by four and, and, and one. Actually, any number here would have done just as well. Um, and then you pick a maximal set of points P in M, no two of which are closer than epsilon over four apart. And so you get this estimate on the, the number of such points, because if no two are closer than epsilon over four are apart, that means their epsilon over eight balls are um, uh, disjoint. And so the number of points is at most the volume of M divided by the, the volume of the epsilon over eight ball. And that epsilon over eight ball is just the same as an epsilon over eight ball in hyperbolic space because with epsilon is, is, is less than the injectivity radius. Okay, so um, you get a, an upper bound on the number of points, which is volume divided by epsilon over eight ball. We only really care what happens when epsilon is small, and then um, small epsilon balls in hyperbolic space look like small epsilon balls in Euclidean space, and their volume is, is just grows like the cube of, of epsilon. And so you get uh, divided by the cube of the injectivity radius. That's where that comes in. So you've got this collection of points. And then from that, you form the associated uh, Voronoi domain, um, which is just a sort of cell complex structure for the manifold, where the open three cells, there's one for each point in P. They just consist of the points that are closer to that specific point of P than to any of the others. So then you um, just triangulate that uh, Voronoi domain by, first of all, uh, triangulating the faces, which are these totally geodesic two cells, by just putting a vertex in the middle of them and then coning off. Um, and then each of these remaining balls is a polyhedron, a hyperbolic polyhedron. Um, you've triangulated the boundary of such a thing, and then you just cone off from the center. And um, the number of tetrahedra that you use is, is, is linear in P. So you have to think a little bit for that, but certainly each tetrahedron that I've put in has one of its points based at, at a point in P. Um, but the number, so we just need to bound the number of tetrahedra coming out of any point in P. And essentially there are only finitely many possible con local configurations. And so you get a, a, a constant. An uh, upper bound on the number of points coming out from a point in P, the number of tetrahedra coming out from a point in P. So um, uh, the uh, so you get this bound on the number of, of, of tetrahedra in your triangulation. Okay, so um, that's the case of a of a of a closed hyperbolic manifold in a bit. I'm going to also talk about a case where you have cusps as well. Uh, Another part of the story are so-called uh, normal surfaces. Um, so these are used a lot in three-manifold theory. A surface uh, properly embedded in a triangulated three-manifold is called normal uh, if it intersects each tetrahedron in a collection of triangles like this, and squares like that. And um, curve. Uh, so the boundary of a normal surface is a normal curve. So a curve in a triangle, when you have a triangulation of a manifold, you have a, it gives you a triangulation of the boundary. 
and um, uh, the, the boundary curve of such a surface is normal in that triangulation. So what that means is that its intersection with each, each triangle in the boundary, it misses the vertices and it, it starts and ends on different edges. So that also play a role in the proof. Okay, so I'm just going to use the variation of, of uh, the construction that I had before in the cusped case. So any cusped hyperbolic three manifold has a triangulation. Ah, what I, I should say what I mean by the triangulation of a non-compact manifold. I mean, I compactified it by, say, removing the cusp, the open interior of the cusp. It has a triangulation where the number of tetrahedra is, again, uh, uh, linear in the big O of the volume times the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. But actually, <clears throat> we can say something a little bit more. That if you, in the case where M is, is, a, is your not complement, and N is a closest even integer to the, this natural slope, and the curve that runs along the torus, the slope lambda minus N mu, so the curve that runs along lambda in the longitudinal direction and minus N in the meridional direction, you could represent that by a normal curve do that with every, any such slope. But this one, you can arrange that it intersects each triangle in the boundary of M in at most one arc. Okay, so this seems pretty technical, but this is, this is crucial. So the way the proof of this goes is, <clears throat> in the closed case, we picked this collection of points P in M, um, a maximal collection, no two of which were uh, uh, close to the next epsilon over four apart. We're going to be a little bit more careful about how we pick the points now in the cusped case. You start off with a maximal collection of points in the cusp, no two, in the boundary of the cusp, no two of which are close to the next epsilon over four apart, and then extend that to a maximal set, the rest of that. It just means that you can control what's happening a little bit more carefully in the boundary. So you form exactly the same construction as before. You form the associated Voronoi domain. In the boundary, it looks something like this. And then you triangulate by just honing off the cell complex, the two cells of the complex, and then the polyhedra. And in the boundary, you get something like this, where each of these little polygons, Euclidean polygons, has been triangulated by coning off. Okay, so <clears throat> we triangulated the, the boundary of our manifold um, and they, these little Euclidean triangles um, and uh, they, they, we've got a, an upper bound on their, their edge lengths. Get most say epsilon over two. So now what we want to do is we want to find a, a normal representative for this slope lambda minus n mu. So what I've done is I've changed the picture here. So just for my own benefit, really, I like to think of mu as, as, as vertical. And then lambda is then going off in some direction. We don't know what. But lambda minus n mu is going roughly in the perpendicular direction. If, if n had been exactly the slope, then that would, have been, that would have been going off exactly in the right angle direction. But n is actually just a closest even integer to the slope, so this is nearly a right rectangular parallelogram. So we want to find a normal representative for this lambda minus n mu. So I just take any old geodesic representative that just avoids the vertices. And then what it does is it goes through these little triangles that intersect each one in at most one normal arc. And that's what I need to arrange. Okay, so this seems like a technical thing, and indeed it is, but uh, uh, this is what we're going to do. Is we're, the next step is we're going to build a spanning surface for my knot, whose boundary is this curve. <coughs> okay, so building a spanning surface. So suppose I've got a normal curve C in the boundary of M, just like that, that intersects each triangle and at most one arc. 
and that is trivial in the first homology of M with mod two coefficients. So our curve is trivial in the first homology of M with mod two coefficients because it equals lambda plus an even number of meridians. That's what I arranged. And so mod two, that just means it's the same as lambda. And lambda is homologically trivial in the manifold. So then the, this says that you can actually extend this to a normal surface F in M that it intersects each tetrahedron in at most one triangle or square. So what we're doing is we're building a spanning surface for our knot, which is normal and indeed it is has very controlled intersection with each tetrahedron. Okay, well C bounds an unoriented surface in M. It's homologically trivial with mod two coefficients that bounds the surface. So you take that surface and you just wiggle it a bit so that it misses the vertices of the triangulation and is intersects the edges transversely. And then what you do is we want it, so we've just picked any old span, any old surface bounded by C. We want to make a nicer one, F. So what we do is for each edge of my triangulation, I put a dot on it or not. I put a dot on that edge exactly when the number of intersection points between S and E is odd. And if the intersection, number of intersection points is even, I don't put anything there. So each tetrahedron has a collection of dots that either looks like this or like this or no dots at all. And then I just join the dots. I join up those points by normal arcs and then they just form a triangle or a square and a bound and uh, uh, that, that they patch together to form a, a normal surface and the boundary of that normal surface is exactly what it was before is exactly C. C intersected each edge of the triangulation, the boundary at most once. Great, so I formed a spanning surface. Okay, so I can now prove the theorem. There it is. So let n be a closest even integer to the slope. Let f be the normal surface that we've just constructed, whose boundary has slope lambda minus n mu. So we can estimate the Euler characteristic of that surface because it's, that surface is composed of triangles and squares, and the number of triangles and squares is at most the number of tetrahedra. And so the Euler characteristic is bounded in terms, linearly bounded in terms of the number of tetrahedra. And the number of tetrahedra was this linearly bounded in the volume divided by the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. Okay, so this is actually a useful fact to know that every hyperbolic knot has a spanning surface whose Euler characteristic is, is controlled geometrically. Form the curates, form of F. We can estimate the signature of the curates form. It's just a, a form on the first homology of the surface. The rank of the first homology of the surface is linearly bounded in that. Gordon and Litherland say that the signature of the knot is equal to the signature of the curates form plus this correction term, En over two, and that's exactly, E, e of the surface was just the, this, this number N here. So in other words, N was the closest even integer to the slope. So in other words, the difference between signature and the slope over two, well, it's at most this plus one because N is not exactly the slope. And we've got con linear control in terms of, of the signature of this Goetz form. It's just big O of the, the volume times the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. So that's that's the proof of theorem one. Sorry, what is the typical order of magnitude of the, how the volume of K relates to say sigma of K? This was my question. In fact, I want to ask 
Are they bound? Oh, yeah. Sure. Right. So often, right, so it's a good question. So there are examples where the volume is bounded, but the signature is yeah, unbounded. Yeah. So um, uh, in fact, those examples, like for example, the highly twisted knots that Andra showed before, they gave examples where the signature the founded volume of the signature is growing in an unbounded way. And that's how we were able to show that the original conjectures were wrong. But typically. Typically. Yeah. Typically, the signature differs from half the slope by, say, the square root of the volume. So, although that's just a statement on average, I can't, that's just experimentally verified. Well, there's a good reason for why that might be. It's because what I've done is I've bounded the signature in terms of the worst case scenario, but the chances are that the signature of a matrix, if I well, what's the number of positive minus the number of negative eigenvalues, right? So if the not if each like eigen if there's those eigenvalues were like independent of each other, then the number of positives minus the number of negatives would be bounded like the square root of the dimension. Yeah. So my other question was right from the beginning, you it seemed like the volume, which I always viewed and maybe first and maybe all you guys too, as the complexity of the hyperbolic manifold. This yeah. the most important number tells you how complicated it is. It didn't correlate with anything on the other side in terms of the knot. Yeah, right. So is the volume does not correlate with the signature. Yeah. No, 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 not the signature, but oh, given the knot in some, you know, we talk about the complexity of the knot and the complexity of the hyperbolic manifold, and correlate. Um, so I don't know what a complexity of a knot is. I don't know what. It yeah, is. yeah. Right. So, like, yeah. I mean. <laughs> it, it certainly is true that, like, if you look at, I mean, I think the main question is, are your quantities signed or not, right? Because obviously volume is only positive. Right? So many of these quantities have a sign attached to them. Um, but nevertheless, it is true that most of those, many of those quantities, their, their magnitude does grow in some way by the volume, yeah. Yeah. And the crossing number. Is... Uh, the crossing number. Yeah. I mean, that's an elementary invariant, but, like, yeah, many of the Hegard invariants. No, 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 so I'm... You've got the hyperbolic manifold, let's just give it as a, take it as a given that the volume is the complexity. Yeah. On the other side, you've got the knot, which this operation is very complicated. And on the knot, I'm giving you some number of crossings and some, some description like that. I don't know what's an invariant, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, okay, so crossing number is a good one. I mean, crossing number, yeah, it's known that the volume is always less than or equal to the crossing number. Ah, okay. But, but 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 they're not and, and on average they're correlated highly correlated okay. but, but, but they're not actually there's not another inequality in another way so they exist not with bounded volume but with unbounded cross did the machine learning pick that up please? oh mm, yeah right it did pick that up <laughs> right so actually that's a really good question one of the roles of the mathematician is to is to see like you know that the, this machine learning is spitting out a pattern that we already know is only true on average. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's actually a really important point um, that, that, that the, it will show, it'll, it might give you spurious patterns, which are just true on average. Right, let me finish by just giving you a quick proof of theorem two. Um, so theorem two is, is, is similar, it says that the signature in half the slope plus this correction term differ by it constant times the volume. You do a similar sort of thing, but now you use the Margulis lemma to say there's some universal number of epsilon that is greater than 0.1. So that when you look at the points with injectivity radius and most epsilon over two, then they're just the cusps and regular neighborhoods of short geodesics. The rest is the thicker part of them. So you just, run the same construction again and just triangulate the thick part. And uh, because your injectivity radius in the thick part is uniformly bound to the below, you don't have to worry about inch to the minus three. Just get the number of tetrahedra is linear, most linear in the volume. This was known to Thurston and Jorgens. So then you form a spanning surface to the knot, just as you did before, that intersects each tetrahedron in at most one triangle or square. And whose boundary slope is again lambda minus n mu. n is the closest even integer to the slope. 
But you haven't specified what's going on inside the thin part, which is the, the, the cusp you don't need to worry about, but these, these the neighborhoods of short geodesics you do. So you have to carefully specify what's going on in that, which I'm not going to go into. So you run the same argument again. You say, well, the, what's the signature of the Goretz form of this surface? Well, uh, it's big O of the volume because that's the number of triangles and squares of the surface. But you also need to take into account the part of the surface that lives inside the neighborhoods of the short geodesics. And it's the, only the short geodesics that have odd linking number that you have to care about. If they've got even linking number, then you can make a spanning surface disjoint from them. But um, uh, the odd linking ones you can't, and so you're forced to do something non-trivial in those, and they contribute to the signature. Gordon and Litherland say that the signature is equal to the signature of this Goretz form plus n over two, and so that means that our um, oops. So that means our signature is half the slope plus some quantity, which is big O of the volume, plus the correction term. So we're done. Okay, so um, uh, let me end with uh, where next. And I think actually that's almost the point of this week is to build collaborations where go in completely new directions, but using some of the techniques that have been learned here. I think there's also just purely from the topological point of view, there are some interesting directions. So once you've linked two different fields, you want to try and exploit that connection. Um, so it's known that the cusp geometry, the cusp geometry has been very well studied over the years. I spent a lot of time looking at myself. It's kind of remarkable that this natural slope hasn't come up before. Um, it's known that the cusp geometry is related to non-hyperbolic Dane surgeries. And therefore now, so is the signature. And is there a more direct proof of this? Perhaps, maybe not the signature, some EGOD variant of it, EGOD Fleur variant of it. I think that was an interesting question. Signature is known to constrain the four ball genus, and hence the hyperbolic geometry is now known to constrain the four ball genus. That I find particularly interesting, this is one of my main motivations for, for looking at this. Are there, are there further applications of this? And indeed, can you prove direct proof that doesn't go by a signature? They're more refined four ball genus estimates. I, I think this is well worth investigating and I, 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 I hope so, I don't know. Um, natural slope, as I say, is a pretty interesting quantity and uh, be worth investigating for its own sake. Can we, can we estimate it for interesting classes of knots? Does it have other applications here? Just two. Um, I, I think that's also well worth investigating. So these are all um, uh, sort of where next type questions that come from the mathematical discovery. But I also think there's a well, where next type question in terms of the machine learning, which is, can we use it to discover other unexpected connections between knot and variance? There are loads of different knot invariants there. There must surely be connections that are there to be found. Why stop at knot invariants? Just... <laughs> so I'll leave that question there as the final part of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions for Mark? Yeah. Um, just a quick question about, about point two about the four ball genus. Um, so, well, maybe two sides, of the, two sides of a question. Um, so is there any, can you see any, can you th think of your proof four dimensionally in any way? Like, is there any way to like sort of push your proof into like, like four dimensional hyperbolic geometry about which I know less than zero? Well, maybe not hyperbolic geometry, um, but because four dimensional hyperbolic geometry is very interesting, but, but typically, um, you know, it's, there aren't many examples of hyperbolic four manifolds. Um, and certainly, if you just restrict it to the world of hyperbolic four manifolds, um, you wouldn't be getting a rich and interesting class. But 
I 100% agree with the premise to your question, which is like, you know, is there a more direct geometric proof of this? I would really, really like to, to see this. In particular, you see, although I chopped it up a little bit, for any given example, it's not going to give you a formal genus estimate that's better than what we had already because it goes via the signature. So we could have just computed the signature. Mm -hmm. But if there was a more direct proof that, that, that worked when the signature didn't work, that would be really interesting. And just a comment based on that is that the, your proof looks like in, instead of the four ball genus, maybe the four, the, the, um, four dimensional cross cap number might be the more natural thing to come up just because you're, because you're going through the, the normal Euler number and, and Gordon and, and Gordon with the limits. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that, might, that, that might be the more natural thing to look at to the four ball genus. Yeah, yeah, that seems like a good point. And can you remind us which not invariants are decisive determined? Like a not complement, uh, the fundamental group of the not complement determines not. Is that correct? Yeah, that's basically true. apart from connected sums. And there's a slight. There's no other invariant like that. Um, because that's a big, that's a that's a hard thing to work with. I guess. In other words, you would want. Yeah, there really aren't. I mean, really, high, the fundamental group and the hyperbolic structure really the only ones that are complete invariants. Yeah, there aren't. Somehow it's those invariants which must be very that you really want to know because they're decisive. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I I, I used to, I, I, I used to believe. Let me, let me talk to somebody who's outside the field. I've never understood why inventing new invariants because they can tell you things that other things can't. So, like but you, you know, know, like Higgard Fleur theory is less discriminating than the hyperbolic structure, but it can give you four dimensional information, whereas the hyperbolic structure. Couldn't. So, so I, I, you know, it, it depends. An invariant, it, you want it to do something. Right? Invariants have to do something. Can't right, so it's really the ones that are decisive are the ones you should. Well, they're the about. ones that the, the ones that are decisive. They're really good because you you can use them to distinguish between manifolds, for example. Right. But maybe they're in questions that you want to ask, ask that are, are not just like the homeomorphism question. Like, uh, okay. Um, but I, you know, that's one reason why I love hyperbolic manifolds is because it is complete invariant. Okay. <laughs> I have a question as well. Sorry, I I like your work in the where next slide. I have sort of like a point to add to that, which is perhaps it will be interesting for me at least as a, like a next step to see a proof by contradiction. Um, so when you take like not invariants that you're looking for knots and not bounds, but like negate that and then run your code and then see what the machine learning algorithms like tell you, because maybe you'll see something, some feature or. Say that again. Basically try proof by contradiction. So like the bounds that you show, try negating it. What if you like look for differences, don't look like for similar knots look for oh. the differences of them and then run the machine learning on it and see what like what what you get from the data. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Well, okay. So I think you may have hit on a slight issue here, which is this is very good at uh, machine learning is very good at predicting one thing in terms of another, particularly when one thing is determined by the other. What it's not good at is saying, for example, these things are different. Like, like how, what would the answer be? Or just that these things are, there's a one-sided inequality. Right? But that's so, the point, like you take a bound, instead of taking a bound, you can take it unbounded and see what happens. It's like taking a minus sign. Instead of saying A is equal to B, A not equal to B. Uh, there yeah, are ways of doing it in computer science. Like, I don't know how you coded this in or anything. I don't know how, like what the code looks like. But that's that's what I would do as a next step. Yeah, I mean, I I would be very interested in 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 let's say I'd be very interested in that sort of thing where you're trying to do where you're trying to get information which is not a prediction of one thing in terms of another. I do think that sort of thing is very interesting. 
but I think it's only one aspect of, of, of this sort of question, yeah. There are actually ways of looking at it. I had an undergraduate project that was similar. It wasn't machine learning, but there are ways in Monte Carlo which machine learning is based off of to do it. But as I said, I don't know how you coded this in. I haven't seen the data set either. Maybe your data set is constrained in such a way that it's not possible, which would explain why, like your answer to the question, but that's what I would look into. Any other questions? Just three random side question. Does uh, this nice hyperbolic unique structure on the complement allow you to somehow pick a distinguished unique nicest spanning surface, or at least when the slope is integral, or if it's not integral, maybe foliation? Uh, the answer is 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 um, not really. Um, I mean, in particular, I don't think. I mean, this construction of the spanning surface is, is, is new. I mean, that said, though, there are things that one can do. For example, given any incompressible, uh, uh, say, any minimal genus spanning surface, um, you can realize it as a minimal surface with respect to the hyperbolic structure, which is a very useful thing to do. And people have done quite a lot over the years. It's not unique, though. But, but there are nice representatives that you get by exploiting the geometry. So I think, yeah. yeah. If there are no other questions, let's thank our